Okay, this is a big story. Uh, this is James Comey. He's very tall, as you can see here. He's the head of the FBI. Um, and there have not been all that many heads of the FBI in our country. The director of the FBI serves for a 10-year term. And James Comey's immediate predecessor in that job was Robert Mueller. He was only the sixth director of the FBI in U.S. history. And he served for even longer than his 10-year term. His term was up in 2011. But even after that 10 years in office, they extended it and had him serve all the way until 2013. When President Obama did finally consent to replace Bob Mueller, uh, to pick somebody new to run the FBI for the next 10 years, he picked a Republican. James Comey is a Republican. He served in the Department of Justice under George W. Bush. He was the number two official in the Bush Justice Department. But in that job, he was known as, if not a dissenter, at least someone who would stand up when something seemed wrong. The legend of James Comey in the Bush Justice Department was the story of him literally racing through Washington, racing to the hotel room of then Attorney General John Ashcroft to try to stop White House Counsel Alberto Gonzalez from trying to get John Ashcroft to sign off on one of President Bush's domestic surveillance programs while Mr. Ashcroft was in intensive care, profoundly ill, and in his hospital bed. So James Comey raced across Washington, raced to John Ashcroft's bedside, and arrived there just minutes before Alberto Gonzalez, essentially in an effort to try to protect the attorney general. Here's how we later told the story during a Senate Judiciary hearing. I told my security detail that I need to get to George Washington Hospital immediately. They turned on the emergency equipment and drove very quickly to the hospital. I got out of the car and ran up, literally ran up the stairs with my security detail. What was your concern? You were in, obviously, a huge hurry. I was concerned that, given how ill I knew the Attorney General was, that there might be an effort to ask him to overrule me when he was in no condition to do that. Right. Okay. I, I was worried about him, frankly. And so I raced to the hospital room, uh, entered, and... Uh, Mrs. Ashcroft was standing by the hospital bed. Uh, Mr. Ashcroft was lying down in the bed. The room was darkened. And I immediately began speaking to him, trying to orient him as to time and place, and try to see if he could focus on what was happening. And it wasn't clear to me that he could. He seemed pretty bad off. That's James Comey talking about his time in the Justice Department under President George W. Bush. That was how he earned a national reputation for being a guy who wouldn't just go along to get along, right? That was how he earned his reputation for being willing to do the right thing, even when it meant bucking authority, in this case, bucking Alberto Gonzalez and Andrew Card, uh, and taking a very politically difficult stand within the administration. Thanks in part to that reputation that he earned under the previous administration, James Comey was nominated last year and then confirmed last year to be the head of the FBI, the head of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And now the Federal Bureau of Investigation has a problem. The New York Times, a few months ago, used the Freedom of Information Act to pry loose these records from the FBI. They're records about the 70 people who FBI agents shot and killed over a roughly 20-year period. From 1993 to 2011, FBI agents shot and killed 70 people and shot and wounded 80 people, so 150 shootings altogether. In every one of those instances, the shooting was reviewed by the FBI itself internally. And in every one of those instances, all 150 of those shootings, the FBI determined that the shooting was justified. 70 people killed, 80 people wounded, 150 people in total shot by FBI agents. Every single one of them ruled by the FBI to be a justified shooting. There are 150 and oh, they're batting a thousand. And maybe FBI agents are angels, or maybe God has assigned individual perfect angels to guide every single bullet ever fired by an FBI agent ever, so that those bullets only ever go exactly where they belong every time. But the fact is that no one else really reviews FBI shootings other than the FBI itself, other than this internal review board. They're federal agents, right? Nobody prosecutes them for shooting people. Nobody looks into their shootings except the FBI itself. And unless you believe in the perfect angels theory of FBI agent bullets, you better believe that something is wrong at the FBI. Even when games are rigged, they do not go 150 and 0. That's not a real record. That's not actually found in nature. Nobody's supposed to be above the law in this country, even the FBI, and there is something wrong, something obviously wrong with the way we are handling FBI shootings if everyone ever reviewed in the last 20 years has been ruled justified. 
In January, FBI Director James Comey announced that the Bureau had completed its shooting review in this man's death. He was shot while being questioned by the FBI and other law enforcement authorities back in May. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of photos, which I should warn you are a little bit graphic and might be disturbing. Um, but from these photos that were taken of that young man's body in the morgue, it appears that he was shot seven times, including once in the top of the head. Law enforcement officials have said that the man was himself unarmed when the FBI shot and killed him. And although the FBI's report on this man's shooting is reportedly ready to go, according to James Comey, he says the report on that shooting has been completed. It still has not been released. The FBI even blocked the county medical examiner from releasing the autopsy report in this case, even though it was completed and ready to go. And again, these images are graphic, I'll warn you again, but the reason we have to count the bullet holes ourselves looking at these photographs in order to try to figure out what happened here is because the FBI won't let that autopsy report be released. The county's happy to release it. The FBI is stopping them from doing so. The reason we have those photographs taken in the morgue is because a friend of the dead man took those photos himself when he went to identify the body, and then he brought the photos to the dead man's father. And it was the dead man's father who then released the photographs publicly, demanding answers about why the FBI had shot and killed his son, why he had to get shot, apparently, seven times, including the top of the head, when he himself was unarmed. And that is where the story goes from sort of weird and worrying to intensely weird and worrying. Because the man who was killed by the FBI in this condo in Orlando, Florida, he was an immigrant from Russia. He was living here legally. But his family is still in Russia, and when he died, his family held his funeral in Russia. And the friend who had identified his body in the morgue and who took those photos in the morgue to give to the man's father, he attended the funeral in Russia. He left the U.S. to go to the funeral in Russia. Even though that man has a green card and lives here in the U.S. legally and is legally allowed to travel in and out of the United States, after that funeral, he was not allowed back into this country. The dead man's girlfriend is also an immigrant from Russia. After interviewing her repeatedly, the FBI had her locked up in an immigration detention facility in Florida and then had her deported to Russia, even though federal immigration officials say that she was here in this country legally and should not have been deported. Another one of the dead man's friends was an immigrant from Tajikistan. The FBI searched out and found an old case that stemmed from a verbal argument after a bar fight. They asked a man involved in that case who had never known the guy he argued with and had never sought to press charges in the case. The FBI found that guy, they sought him out, and they asked him if he would please like to press charges over that year-old argument that had never been pursued as a criminal matter. The man agreed to press charges at the FBI's request, and bingo, that's what they wanted. That allowed the FBI to have that guy from Tajikistan arrested and put in jail. The charges about this argument he had been in were flimsy at best. They were dropped within a month. But it didn't matter because during that month that they had put the guy in jail, his visa expired and he missed a court date to appeal to extend it. And so they never let him out of jail. They just deported him out of this country back to Tajikistan. So the dead guy is dead, shot by the FBI while under questioning, himself unarmed but apparently shot seven times while in the presence of multiple law enforcement agencies. So the dead guy is dead. His girlfriend and his two friends, who were also questioned by the FBI in the same matter, have all now very quickly been deported or kept out of this country since the FBI killed the guy. And the FBI still says, ah, oh, no word on what happened here. The dead man in this case is Ibrahim Todeshev. These new details about what the FBI has done to the other potential witnesses in this case were all just printed in a blistering new cover story in Boston Magazine. Boston, the city, has a particular interest in this case, in the FBI shooting this guy in Florida, because the guy who the FBI shot, Ibrahim Todeshev, was friends with one of the alleged Boston Marathon bombers, Tamerlan Sarnayev, who you see on the left there. And there was a question as to whether both of these men may also have been involved in a triple murder that happened in Boston two years before the Boston Marathon was bombed. If that triple murder in the Boston suburbs had been solved before the marathon, could the bombing have been prevented? Should the guy who allegedly orchestrated the marathon bombing have already been in jail if that triple murder had been solved? But in the wake of the marathon bombing, in the wake of that very high-profile terrorism case, did the FBI botch the questioning of an unarmed man connected to the main suspect in the marathon bombing? Did they then prevent the release of information on his shooting and then deport everyone who could conceivably talk about it or shed light on what happened? And will the FBI, under this new director, exonerate itself again in this shooting the way they have exonerated themselves in the 50, 150 shootings before this one. 
Will they even let us know one way or the other? And how on earth does anyone around the world or any of us here at home look at what we know about this case so far and say that the idea of innocent until proven guilty applies to everyone in this country, even to immigrants? This is the cover story in Boston Magazine right now. It's going to be a big new investigatory piece on This American Life next week, which is going to put a hot national spotlight on this story. The FBI told us today that the release of the report on the shooting is now in the hands of the Department of Justice. So, yes, we're waiting on FBI Director Jim Comey and his reputation for doing the right thing even when it's hard. But if this is now in the hands of the Justice Department, we're also now waiting on Attorney General Eric Holder. This story has not yet been the focus of a lot of national attention, but it is about to be, finally. Now it's time for the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Have a great night.